Hello again. I'm back with Dr. Strayer, who previously spoke to us about cell phones and driver distraction. Um, now, you've mentioned that most people are impaired through the use of cell phone, through cell phone use. Is there anybody who seems to be immune to these impairments? Um, well, that's a question we get quite regularly. Um, a lot of people think, I've seen other people impaired, but, but it's not me. Um, and so we, we started to look at that very seriously. Um, and uh, the, the short answer is that um, there seemed to be a very small subset, uh, probably about two, two and a half percent of, of the population, that uh, are able to perform the kind of dual task combinations of talking on a cell phone while driving without impairment. Um, and we've done some very sophisticated analyses where we've um, measured um, the, the, the areas of the brain that may be involved in multitasking and it seems as if um, this small cohort of drivers um, is, uh, has an uh, extraordinary ability in terms of being able to uh, um, use executive attention to multitask. That is that um, when they are put in this the kind of dual task or multitasking environment of talking on a cell phone while driving, um, they show no impairments whatsoever. Um, whereas about 98% of, of, of people who are driving uh, show very large uh, effects, large costs associated with trying to combine the two tasks. And we're quite interested in that because it does seem to relate very closely to individual differences in executive attention and the role that uh, various brain structures and frontal cortex plays in our ability to be able to coordinate actions and, and, uh, and the like. Um, and so right now we're trying to understand a little bit more about these uh, individuals. Are they in fact recruiting broader areas of, of frontal cortex um, than say a driver who uh, shows uh, uh, the traditional pattern of impairment? Um, and there's some reasons to believe that maybe we're seeing bilateral activation of frontal cortex that's allowing people to be able to coordinate uh, these different activities in a way that most of us can't. Um, and it may be the case also that uh, um, there may be genetic differences that make someone who is likely to be a good multitasker or we call them a super tasker um, different from the general population. Um, and, and there we're, we're right now doing some research looking at uh, some of the genetic uh, um, underpinnings of dopamine regulation because that seems to be one of the neurotransmitters that's associated with uh, regulating frontal cortex and, and some of the areas associated with uh, uh, multitasking. But I always caution people because when we say that two, two and a half percent of the population seems to be able to talk on a cell phone while driving, the, 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 the danger there is that uh, about 90 percent of people seem to think that they're in that two percent. Um, and so um, when people say, wonder, um, are they um, likely to be a super tasker? Well, the odds aren't in their favor. Um, we only see about two, two and a half percent of the population uh, are of this type of, that are having some extraordinary multitasking abilities. The vast majority of us can't do it. Um, and for laws assist with kind of using and regulating uh, activities associated with uh, um, dual task processing while driving, um, we should probably act on the assumption that uh, the vast majority of people cannot do that. If there's a genetic basis for being a super tasker, it seems like they might want to develop tests as certain jobs, such as maybe being a pilot, um, might really benefit from that sort of thing. Have you investigated that at all? Well, it's one of the ideas that you could carry this forward. If, in fact, you can find that certain uh, characteristics of the, uh, of the genome are uh, associated with supertasker behavior or, or a very good ability to multitask, if there are uh, jobs that would place a heavy demand on multitasking, say flying a, an aircraft, flying a high-performance jet, um, it may be the case that um, um, those individuals who have that genetic predisposition are going to be more likely to be uh, able to be successful uh, pilots or other kinds of, in other kinds of uh, jobs that require that multitasking. We know, for example, that right now there's a very rigorous uh, policy or, or procedure for training pilots. Um, and what may be happening in that kind of procedure is effectively through behavioral uh, uh, analysis, they're screening for people who tend to be really good at multitasking. And it may be the case that another way to screen 
would be to kind of look at uh, um, some of the genetic differences between these individuals. We know that um, in some studies looking at uh, pilots versus non-pilots, that pilots tend to be better at talking on cell phone while driving. That is, they have a little bit less of a risk associated with getting into an accident than the general population. So um, there is a good uh, reason to think that um, that uh, there are individual differences in one's ability to multitask, that there are probably some genetic bases associated with that, that um, it's probably associated with uh, uh, a different way in which frontal cortex is uh, involved in, in uh, regulating and maintaining and con controlling the, uh, the various uh, operations associated with multitasking, and that uh, it's possible that we could be developing some uh, measures to be able to identify who these individuals are based on their genetic structure. Hey, right, Dr. Strayer, thank you for coming in and talking to us about your research. We really appreciate it. Glad to be here.